Welcome everybody. I'm Katie Wallace. I'm a naturopathic doctor and this is a talk about the merits of eating fats. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. I'll have time for question and answer at the end. Just want to change a setting here real quick. we go. Okay. So before I go further, I'd like to state that this video is for health education reasons only and should be not be taken and should not be taken as medical advice. I always get the question, can you watch the recording after this? And the answer is yes, I will be posting the recording of this program on my website within one to two weeks of today. If you go to the humannaturellc.com webpage and click on the classes tab and scroll down, you'll see all of my past lectures and classes and the videos. So if you ever want to find some material, feel free to go there. It's all free and accessible. Today's talk is provided in coordination with the Willie Street Co-op. Um, my business is Human Nature and I have an office on the west side of Madison. And then I also offer these monthly webinars at or through the co-op. Um, next month's talk is going to be on hormone balance. So natural ways to balance hormones. That's going to be on Tuesday, July 18th at noon. So I hope you'll tune in. And the other thing I do for the co-op is I offer one-on-one -on -one private sessions to members at a reduced rate. So it's just $45 to get a private consultation with me. You can meet with me at Willie West, or you can have that session over Zoom. So there's a handful of those sessions available every month. In fact, I think I still have one opening um, next Tuesday afternoon and another the following Wednesday, the 21st. So June 13th and June 21st, I have openings. If you're interested, you can contact me by emailing me or calling me. So today what we're going to talk about is how does... Uh, how do fats really help improve health? Um, and we'll spend most of our time talking about that. And then I'll also include some tips for how to digest fat better, because sometimes when people start increasing their fat and they have weaker digestion, they might have issues with that. Um, and I'll try to give you some ideas of, you know, how much fat are we talking about eating in order to begin to see some benefits. I have given two other programs on fats for the co-op and, you know, through my business. So um, you may want to check those out if you're looking for more content. Um, this one, Holistic Approach to Fats and Heart Health, is all about kind of the basic chemistry and explaining the different types of fats that are out there, how to select fats, and also the newest research on the link between fats and cardiovascular health. The other talk I've presented on fats is all about a high fat diet known as the keto or ketogenic diet. So I talk all about what the heck is this? Why is it so great? What are the trade-offs? How would you do it, et cetera? So I encourage you to check that one out too. <clears throat> so today we're going to kind of focus on um, just this basic idea of why are fats beneficial? And I actually think this is critically important. And unfortunately, a lot of the American public sort of shy away from fats. Um, and it's, and hope you find the message I present today to be helpful. What it really comes down to is how the body uses fuel for energy and the benefits and trade-offs of those different fuels. So the body can use a couple different types of sources for energy. It can use glucose, which is basically sugar, which is broken down from a carbohydrate or another high sugar food. So like a piece of candy or um, an apple or oatmeal or rice, all of those represent carbohydrates, sweet potatoes, potatoes. So you get the idea. When those are broken down, they raise the glucose in the body and most of the body cells will use that for energy. The body can also get energy from protein because protein contains glucose. So this most commonly happens if people aren't eating enough, then your body will break down your muscle. 
to get energy by using the glucose inside the muscle. Um, you certainly can eat too much protein, um, but most people don't eat enough protein to be using it as a carbohydrate for fuel. The second source of energy besides glucose, which is mainly from carbs, is fat. Um, and so fat is an easy and accessible source of energy for a lot of the cells in the body, but not the brain. The brain can use some benefits of fat, but really it needs the liver to break fat down into something called ketones. And then the brain and the muscles just love ketones and they really thrive on ketones. So basically there's um, glucose, there's fats, and there's ketones. These are the different sources of energy for the body. So many of the reasons I'm a proponent of eating fat is simply that um, at the end of the day, it works out better um, than having too much carbohydrate or sugar. So those of you that have seen my talks before have seen this slide over and over. Um, this slide is talking about how generally a lot of illness in the body stems from blood sugar problems. And I'm mostly talking about high blood sugar here, but you will have a lot of inflammation from low blood sugar too. So it can happen at either extreme. So when someone eats a food high in carbohydrate, like honey or rice or noodles or cereal or granola bar, something like that, what happens is that the glucose or the blood sugar level in the body raises. And as a result of this, some not so good things happen. Something called AGEs will increase if the blood sugar is too high. And AGE stands for advanced glycation end product. And it's like when there's too much sugar circulating in your body, the sugar begins to combine with proteins and it basically caramelizes. And that's the beginning of a lot of disease processes, we think. That's what the research is saying. So cataracts, erectile dysfunction, cancer, um, oxidation and aging of a lot of the different body systems appear to be correlated with advanced glycation end products. And if you, talk, if you watch my webinar about the holistic fats, I'd go into more detail about this. The other thing that happens when the blood sugar rises is that the body makes triglycerides. So triglycerides are the body's way of storing the sugars for later, but it's very exhausting. If you've ever had a meal and then you need to go lie down and take a nap, your body is making triglycerides. It's taking the extra sugar foods that um, <clears throat> you, you exceeded your intake and it's storing them as triglycerides. When this happens, Overall, cholesterol is going to increase. LDL, small particle LDL, which is the damaging type of cholesterol we think increases. HDL, the beneficial cholesterol decreases. So overall, you're, you're losing some of your protection for your body, protection for the brain, protection for the cardiovascular system um, as these changes in your cholesterol are happening. <clears throat> for men, as the blood sugar rises, testosterone is going to decrease. Men are going to experience an increase in estrogen, which is generally not helpful, generally leads to problems with energy, fatigue, mood swings. For women, the rise in blood sugar is going to cause estrogen and progesterone to shift. Usually estrogen is increasing and progesterone is decreasing. And of course, this can give rise to different diseases um, and different hormonal imbalances. So you see, here's just one well, more than one reason why um, if the majority of your calories coming in are from carbohydrates, you might be setting yourself up for some problems. And I recognize that this is going to vary based on the person and based on the person's lifestyle. People that are more active, people that have more muscle are going to potentially tolerate carbohydrates better. People that have more minerals are going to have a better tolerance for carbohydrates. People that... Um, have more light outside, less artificial blue light, people who sleep better. So there's all these different factors that are going to affect how you handle carbohydrates. But at the end of the day, all of us, as we're aging and we're in this modern culture, it's sort of stacked against us to develop some illness based on these blood sugar issues. There's one other big piece about blood sugar that I like to talk about when we're talking about the effects of the fuel we take in and our bodies. And that is that when we eat a carbohydrate food and our blood sugar goes up, the hormone insulin also goes up. Insulin is a hormone made in the pancreas and its job is to help 
the cells to absorb the glucose. And you've probably heard this, that as we're aging, we become more insulin resistant naturally. What that means is that we make more insulin um, <clears throat> to get the same amount of fuel into the cell. And that's not good because there's all these different side effects from making this insulin. <laughs> um, and one of them, one of them is fatigue um, and, and issues with energy um, and could be problems with sleep. Um, but another big one that I want to talk about on the slide is that when the immune system is activated, it makes a chemical called a pro-inflammatory cytokine. And that's kind of a mouthful, but give you a really helpful word to understand, especially if you're learning about functional medicine and natural health and autoimmunity, because all inflammation stems from immune system activity. And when insulin is high from eating carbohydrates, that inflammation gets perpetuated and promoted. So the amount of inflammation someone has and the extent, the duration, whether or not it becomes a chronic problem of inflammation goes back to how much insulin are you making based on how many carbohydrates are you eating? So it can be very important to talk about what's your primary energy source in the diet. So this is a list of, I um, hope you can see it. It's a little cut off on my Zoom screen. Um, different issues stemming from high and low blood sugar. So autoimmunity, of course, relates back to this because if you've got elevated insulin levels, you've got more chemicals, pro-inflammatory cytokines, and those are perpetuating the inflammation and eventually leading to self-destructive behavior in the immune system. Chronic pain, again, because there may be an initial trigger, trauma, something that happened that caused the initial inflammation and then it's getting perpetuated in this um, high blood sugar, high insulin state. The same with fatigue, the same with cancer. Um, many cancerous cells, not all of them, but many types of cancer thrive on glucose um, and cannot burn fat or ketones. So that can be a strategy. And there have been a number of published studies showing that breast cancer, for example, stems from poor blood sugar control initially my umbrella out of the way here. <laughs> the wind's playing tricks on me. Um, as you know, from because I just presented, the hormones respond to blood sugar control. So infertility and a lot of hormonal problems can stem from um, blood sugar control, which is typically caused by the carbohydrates taken in the diet. Thyroid problems are typically stemming, at least in part, from blood sugar dysfunction because the thyroid has a very hard time managing the T3 and the T4 hormones when the blood sugar is out of range. The same with adrenal problems. The adrenal glands and the pituitary are very much tied up in helping the body manage healthy glucose levels. And so when the glucose levels are not managed very well, we see a lot more adrenal issues, which might tie in with chronic fatigue, adrenal dysregulation, mood disorders also tie in very much with the adrenal hormone levels. Similarly, symptoms of mood disorders are going to be heightened and more extreme when there's blood sugar issues. Chronic skin conditions are something I see all the time um, related back to too much inflammation stemming from carbohydrates in the diet and poor gut health associated with that. Um, and of course, heart disease, we know that some of the most important um, health markers associated with developing heart disease relate back to blood sugar control. Migraines are just another example of chronic pain stemming from um, poor blood sugar control. Now, I'm not trying to say that blood sugar is the only trigger for migraines for people, but it can be a big part and can really help people manage migraines when uh, we work on controlling blood sugar. And, and a lot of other issues. I'm, I'm sure I only listed a fraction here. So, so far, I hope you're starting to get the message that relying on carbohydrates and sugars as a primary source of meal, which is what most Americans are sort of indoctrinated to do, right? They have toast or cereal in the morning, they have a granola bar, um, you know, they have a piece of fruit, um, they have pasta, they have bread. Um, uh, this doesn't really lend itself, especially as one is aging, to 
an optimal lifestyle to, to being pain-free or being as healthy as you can be and even avoiding disease. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, using food as a fuel. Um, I mean, carbohydrates are not all bad, um, but it's just really important that you understand yourself and you understand your health markers or your lab tests and know how to adjust the amount of carbs you're taking in in order to get to your health goals. Glucose or blood sugar, sugar is a great source of fuel. Many cells in the body, most cells can use it, right? That's why we're told we should eat these carbs. And it provides energy really fast. So if you are um, athletic or very active and you need energy, quick bursts, explosive energy, um, then you're going to need some carbohydrates. Um, and, and, and like I said earlier, uh, some people have a higher carbohydrate tolerance than others. If you're doing more endurance activities, you're pretty sedentary, um, then you're going to have less of a tolerance for carbohydrates, especially as you age. So the trade-offs to burning carbohydrates or glucose is that it produces more free radicals. Free radicals create oxidative damage or basically the aging of your body compared to using fat to make ketones for energy. So, so yes, there are these benefits to carbohydrates, but there's also these trade-offs. Um, and one thing we know that becomes very important as we're getting older or if we're just more prone to cognitive issues is that as our cells in our brain age, they really can't burn glucose very well anymore. And so we see a lot of cognitive problems like Alzheimer's and dementia, which are basically um, Alzheimer's is being understood as like a type three diabetes because a person is so insulin resistant, they can't get the sugar to their brain. Um, and so in this case, using carbohydrates for fuel for, for people experiencing cognitive decline is, is really just perpetuating um, their decline. Um, and as I've already stated, too much glucose will lead to loss of blood sugar control or metabolic syndrome where the person's pretty tired, their sleep is uh, disordered, um, they're beginning to experience chronic inflammation, and eventually that'll lead to much bigger problems if it goes uh, unchecked. General benefits to eating fat that people report are um, it becomes easier to burn fat in between meals. So you're more satiated in between meals and feel like your energy is steady. For people that need to lose weight, um, it's often easier to lose weight because their insulin levels aren't coming up. When your insulin levels are too high from eating carbs, you can't burn fat. It's, it's just not possible. You have to wait for the insulin levels to come down again. Um, so for many people trying to lose weight, um, more fats in the diet actually help them reach their goal faster. Um, also, people report a greater sense of being alert and focused because their brain is getting more of the fuel that it needs on a fat-based diet. This is um, all the different conditions in the research uh, reported to benefit from high-fat diets. So epilepsy is a condition where people have seizures. Uh, the brain is not getting any food at all, um, and that's um, part of the mechanism in having a seizure. Uh, and so a fat-based or ketogenic diet is a known um, way to manage and then sometimes have epilepsy go into remission. Uh, type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes generally respond very well to a high-fat diet. I've known a number of individuals who have um, managed their diabetes this way without medication. Uh, certainly, if you have a condition like this, you want to work with a professional, work with the permission of your doctor to change your diet in order to, um, you know, be medication free, but it definitely is doable. A high blood pressure responds to a high fat diet because high levels of carbohydrate are very stressful to the kidneys, um, and this leads to blood pressure issues and inflammation. Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, I already talked about, but one great resource is the book um, uh, by Dale Bredesen, and The End of Alzheimer's. And he talks about using a high fat diet um, to experience a reversal and remission of these diseases. 
Um, obviously, chronic inflammation would improve. You know that because we see a shift in how the immune system functions in a high fat diet. Obviously, blood sugar control would improve because um, you're taking away the carbohydrates, which are prompting the insulin, which is driving the blood sugar dysfunction. Obesity, heart disease, um, PCOS or hormone problems. So many different conditions that are known to benefit from lots of fats. So increasing quality fats in the diet while cutting back on your carbohydrate intake has the potential to help um, overcome a lot of health issues. And I've been working as a naturopathic doctor now for 15 years. And I would say this is the basis of the work that I do with people and have done for 15 years. It's just seeing people transform by changing what they're eating. And when you change the body's fuel, you really can make um, substantial changes. You need to change other things too in the lifestyle, but that's not the premise of today's talk. Um, one other piece about fats that I don't want um, to leave behind today is that the every fat, well, most fats have an omega content, um, either omega-6 or omega-3 or omega-9 fatty acids. And these are very beneficial. The body will take the omega fatty acids and break them down to something called prostaglandins, which is, is really helpful for numerous body systems. So you see all these different benefits from, um, from the therapeutic fats and fatty acids within the fats. So when I'm talking about fats, this is just a picture of some of the fats. Okay, we might have um, olive oil here in the cup in the center, some pumpkin seeds, some nuts, some salmon, which is a high fat fish, some avocado. So these are some examples, um, eggs, um, olives, uh, unrefined coconut oil, more nuts, um, mayonnaise, uh, butter. Okay, these are all uh, lard, bacon grease. These are all great um, fats that are really healthful for the body and very nourishing. And I haven't mentioned this yet, but one of the main things I see in my practice with people is that they're able to get over their cravings and their hunger issues by eating more fats. And the reason for this is that carbohydrates, because they cause the blood sugar to go up and the insulin to go up, can drive a lot of cravings for people. Cravings are more just like a, a symptom of that blood sugar swinging for a lot of people. There can be other reasons for cravings too. Sometimes it relates back to the gut or to mineral levels, but I would say carbohydrates play a huge role. And so if someone can begin to make some changes there, they usually feel much better and much more in control of what they're eating and just much happier all around about how they're eating and how they're fueling their body. Um, so when I start to talk with people about fat, I often get the sense that they're kind of afraid of fat because they're concerned that eating a food high in fat is going to lead to heart disease. I kind of want to address this head on. Again, the other talks that I referenced in the beginning that are on my website go into more detail about this, but I would like you to take home the message that it really depends on what type of fat you're talking about. We know, I mean, there's extensive research showing that if you eat enough omega-3s, omega you're gonna have numerous health benefits. Um, whereas if you're eating a lot of omega-6s, then you're gonna be predisposed to have all sorts of health issues, cardiovascular disease included, you know, in some of those potential outcomes. So here's just an example of the breakdown of the foods that provide omega-3s versus omega-6s. So omega-3 fats are gonna come from the fatty fish, like mackerel and salmon and sardines and flaxseed oil or flax seeds. Although I would say in the research, it seems that most people cannot get the benefit from the flax seeds and the flax. Like I said, you need to take the omega-3s and be able to break them down into prostaglandins. And the research that they've done, at least preliminarily, shows that most people can't do that. So we know though that everybody tested can get the benefit from fish oil. So you can definitely take it on a case by case basis, but generally speaking, most people are gonna do better getting omegas from fish rather than relying on plant-based omegas. You can see the omega-6s or examples of omega-6s in the bottom half of the slide. So we've got you know, canola oil, safflower, sunflower, poppy seed, corn, 
you know, things like soy oil, all those are going to be um, typically important to reduce. So you want to think about increasing omega-3s and reducing omega-6s. And this is because most Americans take in way more omega-6s than they need already. So therapeutically, when I'm looking at people, helping people, I'm going to work with them on increasing omega-3s. You can also get more omega-3s by being choosy about the animal products that you eat. So dairy, eggs, meat from animals that are grass-fed or pastured are going to be higher in omega-3 and lower than omega-6 because the amount of omega fatty, the kind of omega fatty acids in the animal food depends on what the animal was fed. If the animal fed, was fed corn and grain and soy and wheat, it's going to be high omega-6 and it's going to be inflammatory. The same is true for a person who eats that as the bulk of their um, calories. But if an animal is eating a lot of green plants, then it's going to be high in omega-3s. And that's what we want. Just like a person eating a lot more vegetables, uh, you know, could they're not going to get quite the same amount of omega-3s as you get in the animal products, but you can get omega-3s from, from some of the vegetable foods too. So we, you want to think about reducing omega-6s. I would say, um, most people aren't aware that like all of the grains and seeds and the crackers and things like that, that they eat, even the avocado oil, those are all high omega-6. Um, and uh, obviously things like vegetable oils, canola oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, those are all very high omega-6 too. So you want to think about how can we reduce those? So obviously a carbohydrate heavy diet or, or just a standard diet um, is usually much higher in omega-6s. And this is documented in the research. Um, we think that ancestral people had an omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of one to one, and that modern day people on a Western diet have a ratio of 15 to one. And this becomes very important when we see therapeutically what happens when we try to adjust this ratio for people. So if most people are in, on a Western diet are getting a ratio of 15 times the amount of omega-6 to their omega-3, and we work on reducing that, if we can reduce that ratio from 15 to one to four to one, we see an associated 70% decrease in total mortality from cardiovascular disease. If we can get that ratio down to two and a half to one, we see an improvement in people with colon cancer. We see an improvement in people, in women for breast cancer risk. If we can get down to a ratio of two to three to one, we see suppressed inflammation and pain in people with rheumatoid arthritis. And if we um, get that ratio down to even just five to one, we see people have less asthma. So the take home message for fats is, um, you know, it depends on what type of fat you're eating. <laughs> and so you wanna eat high omega-3 fats. Um, and, and if you're eating a lot of omega-3s, then you don't really need to worry about restricting access to other types of nourishing fats. Now, I would not eat um, trans fats or highly processed fats, and I talk more about that in that holistic fats talk that you can view on my website. You can test your omega level with a take-home test. It's a pinprick to the finger. I um, sell this through my office, so if people are interested, you can reach out to me. It's a good way to kind of know, you know, where are you at? How are you doing? And then make some changes from there. Usually, though, telling people to eat seafood or uh, fish at least three times a week really helps um, boost their omega-3 levels. People do like to supplement and the supplements can work, but they do not work as well. And it's been shown in research studies, omega-3 supplements do not work as well as eating the fish. So it's always better if you're someone who likes fish and seafood, or at least is open to eating it, that's going to be a better way to raise the omega-3 levels, which is overall going to have a lot of beneficial health outcomes. You want to avoid farmed fish when you're purchasing fish because a lot of the farm fish is fed corn and soy. And guess what? That would be high omega-6. So it would kind of defeat the purpose of you trying to increase your omega-3s by eating fish. There are some, um, there are becoming more and more some farmed operations where they operate in deep fjords where the, the salmon especially or, or fish like salmon like char are being fed um, uh, more plant foods, more of their real fish food rather than um, corn and soy. And so those can be okay, but generally you're looking for wild fish, not farmed fish. 
The other uh, hesitancy I think there is in our culture about eating fat is that because fat rich foods are so calorically dense, people are afraid they're going to cause weight gain. Uh, but I actually find in practice that people that are looking to lose weight do better eating more fat and less carbs because through that process, they're going to lower their insulin levels and be more effective in their fat loss approach. There's a number of research studies out there showing that high fat diets decrease insulin levels, um, high fat diets um, actually do this better than low fat drug uh, weight loss approaches that are more common. Um, and even the meta-analysis, which is where they look at all of the studies and do a meta-analysis of all of the studies show that um, high fat and very low carbohydrate diets are very beneficial for people who are overweight and people with diabetes. Um, and they actually help more than other equal calorie diets. This is an example of one where you see they took a low calorie standard diet and compared it to a high calorie diet. You can see the hemoglobin A1C, which is a blood test that is the average of someone's uh, glucose control, improved three times more with a high fat diet that had no calorie restriction. You can see their glucose improved more, 20% versus 16. You can see their, B, their body mass index. Uh, they got a greater loss. They got a greater loss in overall weight. Um, so this is when you take a high fat diet and put it head to head with some of these other diets. So it can be impressive. <clears throat> different dietary approaches um, will have different breakdowns. So I know some of you aren't um, necessarily into the numbers, but I wanted to provide some kind of framework so you can understand how the diets compare with each other. The Mediterranean diet, I feel, is often touted um, as being healthful. And I agree that it has many healthful components. Lots of fish and seafood, yes. Nuts and seeds, sure. Lots and lots of vegetables and fresh produce, yes. Where it really fails, I think, is that the Mediterranean diet encourages people to eat whole grains, three to six servings a day. And obviously from what I presented, if you're eating that much carbohydrate, um, that's not really going to help overcome some issues in a therapeutic way. Do people lose weight and feel better? Yes, obviously they do. Um, but is it really going to help them avoid some of the diseases and health issues that I'm talking about, some of these chronic conditions? Yeah, for most people, it's, it's not really going to um, help resolve that in the way that other diets are more helpful. So um, a Mediterranean diet's got 25 to 30%, 35% of the calories from protein. I think that's actually pretty good. <clears throat> Excuse me, I talked about protein last month. So if you missed that lecture, you could go back if you want to do kind of a deeper dive on protein. 35% um, is about right if you want to build or maintain muscle and keep your metabolism high. So I like that. Um, but getting 50 to 60% of calories from carbohydrates, that's, that's going to be too much. I mean, I've been talking this whole talk about getting the majority of your calories from carbs and the problems that that creates. So as people are aging, um, that's just simply not going to work for most people. Somebody that's extremely physically active and has a lot of muscle, maybe that could work for them. <laughs> but the rest of us, um, you know, that that's it's not going to be sustainable for long term health. Um, and then it's got about 25 percent of the calories coming from fat. That's probably about the minimum you want. If you start going a lot lower than that for longer, um, then you can start developing signs of, of fat deficiency. Compare that to a low carb approach, which would be, you know, uh, again, 30 to 40% protein. The carbs are going to be about half of what's in the Mediterranean diet. So maybe 20 to 30% of calories are coming from carbs and 20 to 30 or maybe even more coming from fat. Um, so I, I like this diet, especially for someone who's active that maybe doesn't want to do a keto diet. Atkins, you're probably familiar with. Um, you can see the breakdown there. And then ketogenic diet has the least amount of protein because when someone's actively trying to produce ketones, they don't want to provide more protein that could be used as a source of glucose because the point of the ketogenic diet is to give the body enough fat where it starts 
breaking down and producing those ketones. And that can't happen if you're taking in too many carbs or proteins. The carbohydrate content is very low, five to 15% of calories. So um, hardly any high carbohydrate foods at all. You're not really, I mean, you might eat a couple berries, but you're not eating any fruit. You're not eating any grains, um, it, anything starchy. Um, or if you are, it's just for taste rather than anything substantial. And then 70% of the bulk calories um, are coming from fat. So that's just kind of a range of different diets and different approaches that people may use. And so just to give you an idea of what that's like on a day-to-day -day basis, someone on a ketogenic, which is the very high fat diet, very low carbohydrate, a woman would need to take in the equivalent of six to eight tablespoons of oil or fat daily, a man eight to 10. Um, Versus a low carbohydrate diet, you might be, you're more of a moderate fat intake. You might be taking three, four, five, you know, maybe a little more depending on the person and the amount of calories they take in. For a woman, three, three to five, or maybe even more um, tablespoons of oil or the equivalent for men. Um, and as I said, 25% um, of those calories you want to have coming from fat. So for most people, that's the equivalent of about three tablespoons of fat or um, the equivalent in other foods, meaning like eggs or nuts or seeds, nut butters, things like that. Um, signs that you're not taking in enough fat can include dry skin, especially lots of dry rashes, hair loss, uh, brittle nails go along with that. Having a weak immune system. Uh, most of the high fat foods carry um, the vitamins that are very important for the immune system, vitamin A, vitamin E, uh, vitamin D, vitamin K. So if someone has immune system issues, it can be a sign that they have problems absorbing fat or they're just not eating enough fat. And a lot of times I find people benefit from a higher fat diet in that situation. <clears throat> issues with infertility, issues with intellectual disabilities. This is particularly true in children who haven't received enough fat or enough omega-3s. Um, but I think our knowledge of this is actually growing. We were beginning to see cognitive decline being associated with uh, lack of fat and, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> it, uh, unhealthy reliance on carbohydrates for energy that aren't actually fueling the body properly. Depression can actually be a sign of a fat deficiency and uh, chronic gut issues. This slide just summarizes, you know, some of the good foods um, that you want to be looking for. So eating them in their whole food state is always good. When you're buying oils, looking at unrefined oils, um, definitely avoiding refined ones, choosing cold pressed. Um, and I would very carefully consider any expeller pressed oils because they do involve um, a lot of denaturing and different processes that really change the structure of the food. Here's what a plate would look like for someone on a ketogenic diet. So we had some walleye here, pieces of fish here. Walleye is not necessarily a high fat fish. Um, so we've got some pesto on top, which is obviously very high in olive oil and nuts, and then a salad. So kind of a rainbow of vegetables with a salad dressing that would include a little more oil. If this were a low carb plate, uh, we'd probably be um, maybe taking away some of the fat and having um, maybe a small serving of a sweet potato or some uh, part of a piece of fruit or um, more root vegetables. Um, and if it were like a Mediterranean diet, then we would see, you know, maybe a third of the plate, half the plate might be covered in rice, you know, so that just gives you sort of a visual um, comparison of, of how those diets uh, compare. Uh, I mentioned initially that sometimes when people um, add fats in, uh, they have trouble digesting them as well. Some people know that they have problems with fats. You know, maybe they have a history of gallbladder issues and, and it extends in their family. Um, so dandelion root is an example of a bitter herb that can really help with the flow of bile, help with um, fat digestion. I also like this product, Beta Plus. It's a professional grade product that's got ox bile in it. 
Um, so ox bile can be helpful temporarily to help with even flow of bile. Um, and then somebody typically can switch away from the ox bile to more of like a beet-based um, supplement. Beet powder can be very helpful for this too. <clears throat> Um, another thing that really helps with digestion are things that support stomach acid. And I have other talks that talk extensively about bioflow and stomach acid. So if you want more information about that, you can reach out to me and I or look on the website. Um, so things like more salt, um, more uh, apple cider vinegar, or uh, the supplement betaine and pepsin really help with stimulating uh, the digestive secretions. And stomach acid is important because Digestion is like a north-south process. So if you want to have good um, support for fat digestion from the liver gallbladder, you also often need good signaling in the stomach. So if you're going to make some changes in your diet, I think it can be really helpful to select some markers to be able to track your progress. So I encourage people to get basic blood work done, checking a hemoglobin A1C, a lipid panel, which is the cholesterol panel, getting your fasting glucose done, which is a part of a comprehensive or a basic metabolic panel can be really helpful. You can even get your fasting insulin levels done too. So you kind of know, how am I doing metabolically? Um, if you're looking to get results in your body composition or with fat loss, then obviously doing body measurements and, and weighing yourself can be very helpful. Um, and, you know, not everybody is into counting everything and keeping track, but sometimes when people are really stuck with where they're at with their health, um, it can really help to get more data. And so using an application where you log what you're eating can help you see what percentage of calories are coming in from the different foods you're eating. And then you kind of know, you know, how am I doing? Like, for example, some people might try a ketogenic diet but they don't, they don't really know um, if they're in ketosis or how they're doing. Um, and, and you don't have to um, be doing a ketogenic diet to use an app. I really like the, the Fitbit.com app. I don't have a Fitbit. You don't have to have one for the app, but it's just an example of a free app that helps pull up all the nutritional information of what you're eating so that you can just kind of see how you're doing. Um, so if you're kind of stuck, um, with a health situation, it can really help to get that data. And then you can make changes and then you can see how you're going and then you can make more changes if you need to. So all these are just different ways that really help you to sort of stay on task um, and, and just get more knowledge about what's going on with your body. So the key takeaways would be focus on more omega-3s and obviously that can be done by eating fish and seafood or taking a supplement or for a minority of people doing flax or flaxseed. Um, there's just so many benefits um, to those fats, choosing pastured and grass-fed foods um, for sources of fats also will, again, translate to a main benefit. Whereas you wanna avoid eating a lot of foods high in omega-6 fats. You wanna avoid eating animals that have been fed high omega-6 foods like corn and soy. That's where you're going to see health issues develop. Um, and that can happen even in a plant-based diet, though, because a lot of people eating a plant-based diet will focus on omega-6 heavy foods, and they're not getting enough omega-3s. Um, so it's very important to be looking at the carbohydrate intake overall. Um, if you can keep your carbohydrate intake in a range that's balanced for you, then that's going to help keep insulin levels low, and that's going to help reduce chronic pain and chronic inflammation. And so instead of eating a lot of high carb foods, you want to work on cutting those back and replacing them with proteins and vegetables, and of course, healthy fats. <clears throat>